but when you've had a cardiac arrest, when you've had an ICD shock, when you've had your life fearfully approached, getting some normality, getting some steps in the right directions. Oh yeah, uh, is the is the the part of the women winning formula? That feels good. Yes, yeah. What's up there, everyone? Welcome here to another episode on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I'm Yelis Vaz, a fellow sudden cardiac arrest survivor and your host here on the podcast. Now, in this episode, I had the absolute pleasure to welcome another cardiac health expert here on the show. And uh, that person was none other than Dr. Samuel Sears, a board-certified clinical health psychologist who has done and is doing, I mean, incredible work around the psychological care and quality of life outcomes uh, of patients with ICDs in particular. And for cardiac arrest survivors in general, he has done and again is doing so much amazing work. Now in the episodes in the beginning, uh, Dr. Sears will give a much more comprehensive introduction about who he is and what he does. Uh, but I can tell you, you're in for quite, I mean, an insightful uh, episode. Or I, I mean, I personally learned so much from this episode uh, with Dr. Sears. And for anyone who sent in a question, thank you so much for sending in your question uh, because you also made this episode possible. And there were so many great questions sent in. So I am, I mean, honestly, I hope that every cardiac arrest survivor out there will be listening to this episode as we'll be touching uh, upon some really important topics that, uh, I mean, we as cardiac arrest survivors often deal with and people living with an ICD. Now, if you want to ask your question next time to the next cardiac health expert, then be sure to sign up to the newsletter as that's where, you know, when there is a new cardiac health expert coming up soon, I will send out an email with an introduction about who the health expert is, the cardiac health expert, and uh, also where you can ask your question. Uh, you can sign up for the newsletter uh, in the description. I will put a link for you to sign up, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash newsletter. Lastly, if you want to find all the resources mentioned by Dr. Sears in the episode, do check out the show notes located in the description of this episode, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Dr. Sears, and the show notes will pop up. And last, lastly, <laughs> truly the last thing, if you want to support the project, uh, we have some really awesome merchandise, or <laughs> that's what I think at least. I mean, I love wearing uh, this pullover that I made and, uh, you know, the mug that I created. So, yeah, we have some really cool merchandise. Uh, this one here with the logo of the Heart Warrior Project on. We also have uh, this pullover, but explicitly uh, with a design for cardiac arrest survivors solely. So with I'm a Heart Warrior on. Uh, then we also have this mug, really, really good mug with a quote on it that I don't think you could read right now because the camera is not uh, focusing on it. And we also have that with the uh, design of I'm a Heart Warrior on that is explicitly meant for cardiac arrest survivors. Oh, and we also have a t-shirt, by the way. Now, if you're not per se interested in any of our merch, but you do want to support the platform, then we do also accept donations. Now, to uh, find uh, out where you can buy the merch uh, or make a donation, then also check out the description, as I will also put a link there. Or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash get involved. All right, having said all that, please enjoy this episode with board-certified clinical health psychologist, Dr. Samuel Sears. Dr. Sears, a warm welcome here to the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I am really thrilled to finally talk to you. My pleasure to be here. What great work you've been doing and and happy to uh, make a contribution any way I can. So, like I said before we started recording, I gathered a bunch of questions for li uh, from listeners. I'm going to throw them at you. Uh, but before I will do that i was actually very well actually it was maybe maybe it's a good idea first for listeners you know because i know what you do uh the people who send in questions know what you do 
but maybe for people who are tuning in now uh, who don't, could you maybe briefly explain the work and the research that you do? Because uh, there's so much that you've done, actually, and that you are doing. Yeah, well, I'm a professor at East Carolina University here at the medical school. I'm a professor in psychology and a professor in cardiovascular sciences. And I participate as one of the assistant program directors for the ECU Cardiology Fellowship. So uh -huh. we engage ourselves in how we're training future cardiologists. And I'm the division chief now for what's called innovation and research. So looking for ways to innovate in cardiology, to help patients and to research that. What's most interesting about me is that I've been in clinical practice almost 29 years now as a psychologist, and I'm embedded in cardiology. So I am part and parcel. I am part of the fabric here of cardiology. I'm not uh, some outside consultant. I'm right here in clinic. And uh, so two days a week, I'm in clinical practice. I take care of mostly uh, ICD patients, although I certainly do see patients with surgical repairs and other things. In terms of research, I've um, written a couple of hundred papers around the psychology of heart disease, and yeah. um, it's been an absolute delight. Uh, it's very funny to me. Uh, I'm one of the most common authors. I'm in the top 50 authors in the world on ICDs, but I'm a psychologist. But don't tell anyone. They might <laughs> kick me out of the of the of the group somehow. Uh, what's this psychologist doing with all these cardiology authors? And the reason is because I'm committed to these technologies producing better patient outcomes. Patients need to benefit. I get that the technology works. That's great. I'm so glad the engineers did their job. But what good is it if the end user and that end user is the patient, if they don't get the kind of benefit that, that they wanted? And so to me, my life's works about magnifying the, this amazing technology, magnifying the benefit for patients so that we're not just running around creating cool widgets, but we're creating change in people's lives. That my ultimate goal is that heart patients actually become psychologically stronger hmm. from the experiences. That this disease mm -hmm. has a way of transforming people. And that transformation process, I think, is an opportunity to value life differently and to live with a emboldened spirit. And that's the best part of being a psychologist. I get to spend time on that. I get to I get to see that at, you know every day in clinic. I get to I get to feel that. And as a researcher, I get to try to document that. So uh, it's a I mean, it's been an incredible, incredible professional life. I've been honored to know so many heart patients, so many amazing, tough, gritty people who were able to overcome the most terrifying event you could possibly experience, most likely, and survive. Mm. Uh, what, what got you actually interested in the first place in, in psychology and to become a psychologist? Well, I think the main thing was I, I had gone to uh, the University of Florida uh, to play American football uh -huh. and uh, I got hurt and then I got interested in how people get better uh -huh. and then I got interested in how people get better from really bad stuff and there was a, a opportunity there to work with heart transplant uh, so it's about 1993 or so and I did my dissertation research on heart transplant but it was very frustrating because in the U.S., uh, organ shortage, um, yeah. you know, we don't have enough organs for all the people that need them. And so I got interested, what else can we do? You know, mm. What else can we help these people with? And along came this defibrillator that people weren't sure about. And only about five to 10,000 Americans were getting them at the time wow. uh, annually. Yeah. And um, so it was mid-90s. And then I said, well, gosh, we got to understand this because transplants probably not the future we just don't we don't have enough organs so we're going to have to come up with something we can make more of uh and uh this is how i did it and so i just really sought out to take care of more patients and to do more research and to speak more and just constantly pursue this amazing technology and figure out ways to make it better and and more quality of life centric and not just uh life-saving mm. You always knew that you wanted to become a psychologist? 
No, I wasn't so sure. I, I really wasn't so sure. I thought maybe I'd become a, a coach or a pastor or I don't okay. know, some sort of youth youth person. You know, I just teach her. I really didn't know. I knew I wanted to do something around how people get motivated. Uh, yeah. As you can tell, I'm a little bit animated about stuff. So I yeah. love I love life, man. I get really excited about every day in some weird, strange, wow. you know, puppy kind of way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow. Well, I'm, I'm only but thankful that you ended up becoming a psychologist and doing all this work because you have helped so many people. And when I was gathering questions from people, so many, so many people told me how, how awesome you are <laughs> as a person and how, how much incredible work that you've done. So it made me only, only more excited to do this conversation with you. So well, people are very kind. I mean, I, 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 um, this works allowed me to get to know so many people and to understand the the impact of them on me as well. Um, you know, th being a psychologist working with heart patients is an incredibly privileged position. People are threatened. This disease scares people to the core and scares their family. And so when we can approach them with respect and honor for what they're going through and and pursue a desirable outcome we're, we're we got a great team right? yeah like, yeah because yeah. everybody wants that to turn out better and yeah. and we have great technologies we just have to f create those technologies to to fit with people's yes. um life and, and lifestyle and hopes and dreams yes so i am gonna throw some questions at you Okay. Um, All right. Great. And like I said to you, I am going to paste it in the chat so you can read with me. Sure. Uh, hold on. Let me paste the name here too. And I actually thought to start with uh, a first question from actually the person who introduced me to you. So that's uh, Douglas Ratchek. And by the way, I will also say uh, that I will mess up quite a lot of names. So... Uh, I will already apologize in advance <laughs> for for the people listening. Um, and so also to Doc, uh, if, he, if he's listening, thank you also for introducing me to Dr. Sears and for making this actually happen. So the I question... Know Doug well, he's a good guy. Yeah, yeah, he's, he's a good guy, exactly, yeah. Uh, all right, so the question. Uh, I think one thing that would be super helpful to talk about with Dr. Sears is to go over some typical signs of PTSD and anxiety and depression. I had trouble sleeping and had violent nightmares for years before I learned those were some pretty solid signs of severe and anxiety and PTSD. Once I knew, once I knew what was causing the nightmares, I was able to focus uh, on tackling the problem with my therapists and fewer nightmares meant better sleep. So I made a little summary of that question. Basically, what are clear signs of PTSD and uh, and anxiety or depression? Well, there's probably many questions in this. Let me try to point out a couple of key uh, landmark or key symptoms that we want to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. First off, anxiety uh, certainly can result from both the experience of heart disease as well as the treatments of heart disease, like, for example, receiving IC shocks. Yeah. So anxiety, of course, is that difficult to relax, intrusive thoughts, uh, worry, and uh, hyper-arousability. So anxiety is a, the most common symptom of, of a post-cardiac effect, uh, both from the treatments and from the disease. Depression's a little bit different. Of course, depression is going to be marked much more by depressed mood and what we call yeah. anhedonia, or life's just not much fun, yeah. right? You just don't enjoy life. And nothing really kind of revs you up. Um, so th that distinguishes anxiety and depression. In ICD patients, these two things sort of blend together in ways that are, you know, we think about 70% of our patients blend those things when they have problematic symptoms. But maybe we should anchor things there first. We think about a third of, of patients with cardiac arrhythmias, about a third have an anxiety or depressive state that is problematic. Now that means okay. then that about two thirds, about two thirds don't 
Now, they'll have symptoms of anxiety, you might have some blue days, but they don't have that sort of persistent, problematic level of anxiety and depression that causes them to withdraw. And withdraw is really one of the things we focus most on clinically. We call that avoidance behavior. And that really leads us to the, the, bigger, the bigger diagnosis, right? The bigger diagnosis here is PTSD. So PTSD is marked by hyperarousal. So feeling stirred up and hard to relax. Mm -hmm. Intrusive thoughts and nightmares. So constantly trying to avoid the thoughts and feelings, but they just keep coming in. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, disengagement, trying to withdraw from all types of of content and emotions. Sure. Yeah. So in short, we think PTSD is a pretty normal type of initial response, which is a little bit of withdrawal, but then it persists in the effort to try to suppress or prevent that discomforting feeling perhaps magnifies its return. That, that this hyper arousability, this intrusive thinking, um, these kinds of components and withdrawal um, come about because we're trying to avoid them and avoidance just really doesn't work all that well. Even in the question that was posed, the, the, um, the question person, I guess it was Doug, got better when he began to deal with or confront some of these thoughts and feelings. And, and so, you know, PTSD we think occurs you know, closer to about 20% uh, of our ICD patients. But 20%. what's interesting is that almost all, yeah, mm -hmm. what's interesting is that almost all ICD patients are somehow told they have PTSD at one point. So it's it's kind of thrown around a lot. Yeah. And I actually yeah. recently taped a webcast um, that for patients about PTSD for the SADS group, the Sudden Arrhythmic Death Syndrome group, where I really said, look, you probably have been told you have this, but it's not as, that's a very formal diagnosis. You may have some symptoms of PTSD, but um, that you probably, you know, we could be more cautious about saying, oh, I have PTSD. I think many people have symptoms, intrusive thoughts or recurrence or avoidance or hyper arousability, but, but PTSD is a very specific syndrome. That's true, yeah. And you also have something as acute- So that was a big question. Yeah, yeah, that was a big question. Maybe, maybe the next one will be a little, a little easier. <laughs> and, but not. you also, you, <laughs> you also have something as acute stress disorder, right? Which also has similar symptoms yeah. as PTSD, but it just ends after a month. PTSD is more if it's yeah ongoing, right? That's right. So we use that in a, in the short term for people who you know have been through something yeah substantial. We do, it's simply limited by time if you will, acute stress disorder, yeah, zero to 30 days. And then we have to either change the diagnosis to PTSD, which it's really just the part of the continuum. It just helps um, in terms of diagnostics, but it's not particularly, um, acute stress disorder doesn't d necessarily mean you get PTSD, but if sure. the symptoms persist, then you get the longer PTSD. Yeah. It diagnosis. can be a normal reaction to an unusual event, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we see it a lot. Interestingly, um, you know, most of the time we don't get referred those patients. We do some, but acute stress disorders from a cardiology standpoint is kind of expected almost. So they really mm. don't say, oh, I better refer this patient. Whereas if you came back six months after a multiple shock experience yeah, and you say, look, I can't sleep and I, I have nightmares about getting shocked. I have phantom shocks. Um, I disengage from a from activity, you're going to get referred. So we don't see as much acute stress disorder because it's normalized. And how common? I mean, so PTSD is about 20% of patients, right? You said? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And then anxiety and depression? How it kind of differs. It, it, yeah, it differs a little bit based on whether there's been an acute cardiac arrest versus, uh, you know, uh, uh, simply the diagnosis of arrhythmias and you got a, a primary prevention ICD, right? Which is so secondary prevention refers to a frank 
cardiac arrest mm -hmm. that a defibrillator is put in for mm -hmm. versus um, patients we see as at risk for arrhythmias in which we consider those patients called primary prevention um, because the conditions are right for a, um, a, a light, potentially life-threatening arrhythmia. So we put in a device in those patients. And how common is an anxiety and depression for, for patients? Yeah, so we have multiple studies. I mean, we have many, many studies. They range anywhere from 15 to about 35%. So the number I like to use is around 25% for depression and around 33% for anxiety. And so that just means that, yeah, there's a sizable group of patients that need additional support. And who wouldn't? You could kind of understand. You know, I don't think that that somehow sig um, symbolizes that they don't have what they need. It just means that the conditions that happened around their disease uh, have left, um, you know, a mark in a way. And anxiety can be worked through. Depression can be worked for. These are very treatable conditions. Mm -hmm. um, if we can get away from the stigma and yeah. if we can get away from, from some of the... Um, I don't know, trite, if I will, trite ways of managing some of these things. I think sometimes this is hard work that requires some professional support. And uh, and that's okay. It, 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 it just doesn't have to be something that is shameful. It can be something that you can almost be proud of, your willingness to engage, the courage to have a look at what you've been through. Um, I think it's a mark of strength to be able to approach that, which terrifies you. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, shame is definitely something that holds people back to do deal with some mental health issues. But what you said, like it's reframing the story a little bit, right? What you're telling yourself that it is a mark uh, of, yeah, it's something brave, actually, if you can walk through this. Yeah, I mean, it's not all about the patients, too. I mean, the, the mental health professions have struggled for struggled as a way to present themselves in a way that will be acceptable to everyone. You know, you have this, in, in the States, we have, you know, people on TV that espouse all these opinions and things like that. And I think that that's watered down some of our, um, mm. it's watered down the commitment to the evidence base. Um, what I, what I, one of the things I love about cardiac psychology is that we've tried to create that evidence base myself and many other researchers have tried to be very consistent with producing studies about the best ways to approach things yeah. so that we're both efficient and um, scientifically supported for what we do. All right. I'm going to throw another question at you um, from, all right, let's paste it in the chat first, uh, from Kelly McElroy Jolly. So the question is how to cope with everyday life post arrest, how to control the anxiety depressive episodes, any specific therapy you can recommend, et cetera, MDMR, cognitive slash behavioral therapy, uh, any holistic advice. Uh, and then I added uh, this to it. Uh, you know, what can we as survivors do to cope and work through problems of anxiety, depression, or PTSD caused by cardiac arrest or, or from living with an ICD? Uh, any suggestions on that? Well, yeah, another big question here, right? So basically, how do we yes. maintain mental health? Well, well, I think a couple of things. First, I, I think you have to treat yourself like an elite athlete where you get good rest and you hmm. focus on the, the ways in which you live your life so that each day there's a degree of performance. Each day you want to put your best self forward. And so the first thing is just the physical limitations all of us face so sleep and eat and rest and exercise yeah so the first one's physical right the next one is i think cognitive behavioral therapy is the one that's been shown to have the most evidence in this space there are other therapies that work too but but cognitive behavioral therapy is consistently researched and we've written some of those papers and we that's been well researched around the globe not every paper uh, with every group has been shown to have an effect. There's a study out this week, actually, um, from Denmark, where researchers took all comers and gave them a web-based intervention, and it did not produce any changes. Um, when you focus on patients who are distressed, 
not just all comers, not just everybody who has a defibrillator, but people who have a defibrillator and are distressed, cognitive behavioral therapy pretty consistently shows an effect. Um, there, we've seen the effect in all comers, but I mean, some recent studies have not found that. So it's really about each of the studies, it's who they bring into the study and whether or not they can produce change. If everybody feels great, and you recruit a bunch of healthy, happy people and go, hey, I'm here to treat you and make you happier. Well, they're already happy. There's, there's yeah. nowhere for them to change. <laughs> and so this is the struggle we face because we want all ICD patients, all patients with cardiac disease to get the kind of care they need. But when we try to do research to show who should get it, it's often a, a tricky trick. Do you give it to everybody or just look for the distressed people who are most likely to show an effect? So anyway, so CBT is probably, so number one is take good care of your, your body. Number two is begin the process of taking care of your mind, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. It certainly can be information. I think smarter patients, meaning patients that understand what's wrong and what, and, and what, what treatments are being provided, makes them better patients and makes them more confident. So um, I think approaching information, learning about your condition does make sense. It doesn't mean you need to you know, past medical school, but it means that you need to be able to say, I have a defibrillator and uh, this is what it is. This is what it does. And this is why I'm safe. Okay. So, so physical, cognitive, behavioral, uh, information, certainly support. I think there's gotta be, if I had to give a number, three or more people based on some research, three or more people that you can go to and say, I'm worried today about my heart. I'm worried about my future. You need to have three or more people you can talk to about that. So we'll call that social support. So I don't know, so that's three or four things. So what, the next thing is, uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. And does it matter if it's online or offline, those three to four people? So it doesn't matter. If we don't have very good data online. What we do have is that online, that people who go online tend to be more distressed. We do have data on mm, that, okay. but that doesn't matter. Being distressed, you can still help people that are distressed. In fact, helping people is among the most psychologically positive things you can do for yourself. I mean, altruism or caring for somebody else, doing for other people is the fastest way to be more content with your life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's a, that's a great, great idea to, to actually try to help each other. Um, you know, just in terms of a couple other quick ideas about things that help, I think being physically active, having a green light from your doctor to be able to go and live life. And I don't mean in some vague way, but it's like, I like to go watch football games. I like to go on hikes. I like to do whatever it is you like to do, get the green light explicitly from your medical team and then you got to really plan for it physical movement yeah. may be one of the most important single things we can do across the board um it goes on and on and on i mean we could just forever talk about the importance of movement and exercise um and i don't mean you know you got to be a champion at anything i just mean being able to get out and move your body and so that's psychologically powerful being activated, being engaged in your life is psychologically powerful. I mean, I kind of think about this whole th this whole area as like, okay, we're kind of in the game of confidentology. We're trying to create confidence about your future, confidence about yourself, confidence about your your safety and about your your team and your medicines and your device. I mean, we're trying to restore a confident perspective about about living with heart disease i mean that's it that's that's the target you know so ptsd anxiety and depression they're the they're they're the problem but the process of managing that problem whether you have those symptoms or not the process is the same it's this this yeah, yeah. hearty life that i'm talking about yeah Okay. So I could okay. go on, but I think that that sort of gives you four or five, you know, yeah. major headlines in terms of things that can help you, you know, create that confidence and create that durability to take on when things might change. You know, the other thing about this is like, this is not a stressor that's gone. This is a stressor that's ongoing, right? You're going to manage this disease over, over the life. So, so, you know, some of the PTSD around them uh, and other things, it's like, well, the threat comes and goes, and now you got to deal with the aftermath. Well, in this case, we have a threat 
that comes and goes has an aftermath and then has a pre a pre prelude yeah. <laughs> or a preface i don't know how to say that yeah. <laughs> um, and so i think that that means that okay we got to get more serious about this we got to be deliberate yeah be deliberate mindful thoughtful about about how we both gain and maintain confidence. So I Good. think it's a real task. Yeah. That's why I love your show. That's why I love what you're doing because I don't. I don't think this. This is a get go away, get away kind of thing. This is a okay. Yeah, we're on a good run here. Yeah. And, but if things change, we'll be ready to deal with that adversity mm. as well. We're open to that. We're not afraid of change. We're not afraid of if things went got worse. Okay, here's what we're going to deal with it. That that. That silver lining mentality is something I've been talking a lot about. We learned from the cancer literature about the importance of maintaining, okay, well, even if the worst happens, I'm going to find something good. I'm going to keep yeah. on going. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Good stuff. All right. Treat yourself as an athlete. I actually like that. That's, uh, yeah. Um, let me throw um, uh, another question, actually, also uh, around an anxiety uh from jane and so okay dr sears what are some of the best ways for cardiac arrest survivors to handle anxiety attacks as well as frustrations from memory loss due to the lack of oxygen during the arrest uh and then i uh, added this to it so basically what to do during an, an anxiety at attack um, and as well, any suggestions on techniques or tools to help survivors listening who have trouble with memory? Because that's quite common, especially in the beginning. Uh, so these are actually uh, two, two questions, right? So first of all, what to do during an, an, an anxiety attack? What should someone do then? Maybe let's start there first. Okay. So an anxiety attack is common, right? So people with heart disease and without heart disease. Uh, have panic attacks, right? It's usually, uh, by definition, a panic attack comes out of the blue. It's usually not triggered by something. It comes out of the blue. It's an intense feeling of anxiety, uh, of danger that uh, typically persists for about 10 minutes and can feel very disorienting, can uh, feel like you're going to die, um, and and, and chest pain and things in a heart patient that are particularly disorienting, right? So if you're worried about your heart and then you experience some chest pain or shortness of breath, it's a dirty trick, right? Yeah, it's yeah. A dirty, dirty set of symptoms. Hmm. Um, cruel in a way. So what can we do about those things? Well, first and foremost, um, being able to say that, okay, sometimes I have these and when I do, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to ride them out. Certainly, you can have them medic. You can have one medically checked out, but almost certainly will will feel comfortable because if you have a device in, or if we need to assess that further from a cardiology perspective, the cardiologist will do that. But panic attacks are, are, are normal. We people have them um, because they they tend to be driven by adrenaline rushes. They tend to be driven by our thoughts, and so oh goodness, here comes one of those panic attacks. Oh my gosh, this is bad. And I hate to put it this way, but your your heart listens to your mind, right? So right. Or your mind, yeah. your mind's your mind's involvement in yeah. terms of oh my gosh, am I in trouble? I think yeah. I am in trouble. Oh my gosh, this is one of those times I'm having one of those attacks, and you can feel the accelerant the accelerating nature of it because it's a smart bomb, right? Hmm. It's exactly the set of symptoms that you're constantly vigilant for, and then they hit. Mm. and they're magnified. So what can we do about this, right? So the first thing is to remind yourself that you are safe. You have a defibrillator, you have medicines, you have people around you uh, in most cases, and that you have been medically checked out to the fullest extent possible. Mm -hmm. So first and foremost is the to try to shut down some of the, the, the accelerant of the thoughts and simply to say, I, I'm going to be okay. This is one of those runs. Secondly, breathe, right? So breathing is such a key component. I mean, I have never found a way to make breathing uh, exercises sexy. You know, I've <laughs> never found a way to like get people to go like, hey, let's do some breathing. Like it just yeah. sounds so hokey. 
<laughs> and yet it's so important. Yeah. Uh, breathing is the key. If you look at the way elite soldiers are trained or elite athletes are trained, breathing is their, their absolute secret. Under fire, under pressure, breathing, focusing on slowing down your breathing because there's a relationship to heart rate to breathing. And it's also gives your mind something to control mm -hmm. rather than, Oh, I'm out of control. I'm out of control. No, nope, I'm in control. I'm going to breathe and I'm going to focus on slowing down my breathing and I'm going to perform at the highest level, just like elite soldiers, elite athletes, elite speakers, you know, controlling anxiety via breathing. So First and foremost is understand what's happening, which I described for a second, is understanding how your thoughts are adding to it. Third, understand how your breathing can be controlled. I think fourth is uh, to um, almost open yourself up to it and say, you know what, bring it. You know, open yourself up, accept some of the things happening rather than trying to fight them. I think one of you know, some of my colleagues here have been Come very focused on psychopathology, whatever that means, you know, people suffering from anxiety and depression in the broadest ways, that one element that appears to be present is this idea of blocking, block emotions, stop them, try to block all emotions. And that that doesn't really seem to work all that well, that rather when you simply say, sometimes I get anxious, sometimes I worry about things to a point where my body will just kind of run off. Okay rather than catastrophizing about them. The last thing about panic is there is a diving response that's kind of interesting, right? There's, um, you can put your face in cold water and it does seem to, all mammals have this, it's called a diving response. It's a very interesting idea. I mean, if you really are trying to break out of a panic attack, to put yourself in cold water, put your face in cold, like in the sink, and put your face in cold water, and it does seem to ah. pretty rapidly um, affect that. It's kind of an interesting technique. I don't use it a lot, but occasionally um, we do. And I think the other thing is we'll use what's called a grounding approach, in which you can do this also with a cold water in the sink, is put your hands in the water and focus on where you are right now. Grounding means putting yourself, grounding, like putting your feet in yep. the ground and saying, okay, I'm here right now. I'm not, I'm not in trouble. Yeah. Everything's okay. Notice your surroundings. Make sure you understand where you are. You're not somewhere jumping ahead. You're not allowing your mind to jump ahead. That if you just simply ground yourself, that often that will bring the panic attack to a shorter conclusion. Um, the problem is with panic attack, and the, probably the way the question was posed is that, man, when they happen, they are just awful. People really struggle with them. But with these more mindful techniques, these with, with treating everything like, yep, Bring it on. Here comes adversity. I'm ready. Rather than, oh, I hate these. They're so bad. They are pretty bad, but they're also manageable. Okay, so that was the that was the big part about dealing with panic. Now, there was a yeah. second. Oh, memory. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Memory, yeah. memory is uh, much more elusive, right? So memory, uh, I think the key here with memory is, I mean, cardiac arrests and time down, hypoxia or anoxia or anoxia, which is meaning times in which oxygen was low or not getting to the brain certainly can change cognitive function. We don't have any great treatments for that. I mean, it's not like you're missing some secret supplement or something. There's no evidence. Any you know, These are very limited, any evidence that any of these things work. What does seem to work is reducing anxiety and depression, right? Because when you worry about memory, you go, oh, I got to remember, I got to remember. And you're like, okay, but your arousal is probably interrupting the memory process. Um, I, I, I tend to tell my patients that, look, the main problem with memory in the most cases is, is attention, that you never, the, the information didn't get in, so you don't remember it because it didn't really get in. Um, I, I have a silly way of thinking about memory. I think of it as kind of like a loading dock. Somebody hands you a package, and that's your attention. Then you put it back on a shelf, which is your memory, and then you come back out to the dock and go, hey, I want that package back. Can you remember where you put it? <laughs> well, yeah. perhaps, but only yeah. if you know if you paid attention to what the box looked like. Yeah, yeah. Right. You may have assorted it. And so this idea of of memory and recall and recognition, you know, I, I that's not my expertise area. I, I my approach is typically to simply acknowledge, yes, it can happen. Yes, you're gonna have some changes in attention. 
and you know to use the kind of memory aids things like writing down things more you're going to have to be more deliberate in reminding yourself but see i think those are attention things if you're more deliberate by writing down what what you're trying to remember then you have two ways of knowing it you heard it you're trying to remember it you wrote it down so you have muscle memory of written it down and you have the card in your pocket i mean you got a good chance you got a good chance of remembering if you do all three of those things not that that's perfect and not that that's always practical i mean you know, it turns out scuba divers can't remember stuff like that too well. But, you know, other than that, I mean, you can, it's a pretty good reason to, um, to, to remember something if you use multiple tr strategies. You know, what's common, too, across all these questions is using tactics, being thoughtful about what you're trying to do. I'm trying to manage my anxiety, so you think about thinking. I'm trying to manage my memory, so I think about my thinking, right? In each of these situations, being more aware or mindful of what you're trying to do that's a pretty good strategy the fact that you're you're not just not just wandering through things i wish i wasn't anxious i wish i didn't forget stuff no being thoughtful and and proactive about these things really helps and mm. and um, i think that's really the message across questions too yeah Okay, these are awesome things, all very practical things uh, to use. All right. Uh, okay, so this question is, it's actually a question that I have a lot of feelings around myself because um, I'm first just going to paste it and read it to you and see what you make out of it. But I have a lot of thoughts and feelings around this question myself. But I'm going to let you first uh, do the talking. So this is from Nicholas. Post-arrest, I'm always told how lucky I am, yet often I wish I didn't make it. Why? It's a really tough, tough one. Yep. Right. Yes. It's not an easy answer here. I, I, I'll take a couple of stabs and then I'd love to hear what you have to say. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I think that um, one of the problems with the first part of the question is being told how lucky you are really invalidates yes the negative side yes exactly so that it's like you're not allowed to feel negative because you're lucky mm -hmm. and just like we talked about when you don't experience emotions or try to block the emotional experience of emotions it just doesn't work that well yep we are who we are we feel what we feel mm -hmm. and to me the negative side is really the invalidation so that's that's my first part. Now my second part about you know wish I didn't make it, mm -hmm. I think means that the emotional invalidation, the blocking of people people blocking you from experiencing what you're feeling, I think pushes it down, and in a way it sort of festers. I hate to use these words; they're so um, they're psychologic sounding, but I mean just when we don't when we try to push aside thoughts and feelings but they're authentic to us, yeah. they have a way of returning. And taken to a rep repetitive number of, over the course of years, people say, you're just so lucky you made it. You should always mm -hmm. be happy. Yeah. That I think there can be a tendency to say, you know, I'm exhausted from this invalidation. And some days I'm not even sure it's worth it because I yes. feel so disenfranchised, depersonalized, disengaged from my actual experience because everyone tells me that I, I'm um, lucky. That's my take on that. Yeah. Um, but it's a very serious question. And I, I, I don't know if it can be done justice on a podcast, but that's the beginning of where I would approach that. What are yeah. your thoughts? Yellis? Yeah. I, I, I think personally you hit it for me, you know, um, and I don't know if Nicholas meant it, in this way, of course, but what I'm reading and kind of feeling is something that I've felt a lot too. I've been told a lot myself that how lucky I got. And in a way, I got lucky, of course, right? Because it's down to chance that I'm still here. But at the same time, it was th there wasn't any room for all these feelings that I was dealing with. Uh, when you, you tell someone you, you're so lucky, you don't allow room for all this negative or, or, or all these other emotions like sadness, yeah. anger, the range. Yeah, and you it's are It's just the range of emotion. It doesn't have to be negative. Just a range. Sure. You know, can I be a lucky one day and 
angry yeah. in the next. That seems okay, doesn't it? I mean, yeah. I'm a human. Yeah, and and you. So I look, and most cardiac arrest survivors look very normal from the outside, right? You wouldn't say that I lived with an ICD or that I had a cardiac arrest that I died. Uh, and this is the frustrating part that I've heard a lot of people tell me, like, "Oh, but you look so normal," which results, which they take as like, "Oh, but you must be fine." But you know, I deal with all the medication and the side effects of that. Uh, you know, the ICD and some fears around getting shocked. I already got shocked before and just the lifestyle restrictions. And there's a bunch of things. Life is a little bit less carefree for me than it used to be. Mm-hmm. And maybe Nicholas is experiencing something similar. And when you get told then each time you're lucky or you look normal, then people are just not understanding what you're experiencing actually really because it's more than just that yeah and i think being misunderstood is psychologically toxic yes yeah i think when we when our emotional experiences are invalidated or just not taken someone doesn't take the time to understand them it can feel pretty lonely yes and i think that's another component of this is like well as much as everybody who in your life who loves you it'd be easy to say they don't understand It'd be easy to feel lonely. It'd be easy to feel singled out. And so one of the things we work on with this is really practicing telling the people in your life the rest of the story. It's scary for the listener. It's scary that sometimes we don't understand why cardiac arrest happened. It's scary for people to realize, wow, I mean, this could have happened to me. And sometimes the people saying, oh, you're so lucky, are people managing their own reaction, their own perceptive threat. True. I I don't think that's going on for everyone, but, but I do think that it can result in a lonely experience for for heart patients particularly young ones i mean we're particularly noting that i mean you're a young guy you know all of our research over 30 years has consistently shown that people less than 50 have more challenges than everyone else and it's because the the hit on the lifestyle the hit across the lifespan um the the years left to live uh, disease-free, uh, trouble-free, however you want to say it, you sort of hit it at. They're more profound, and they're more the 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 smart bomb of cardiac arrest has much more fallout, much more concentric effects, and um, so so I think all of that. But it just gets at the general idea, and I mean a major theme of this of everything that you and this group of folks do is you're validating each other's experience being together you know not that you need a bunch of hand holding but you but but there is a a degree of mutuality universality mutual respect for for maybe some of the things that are unsaid that are part of the experience here so so i think this is a really important question i think it's brave as i mentioned earlier i think it's brave for nicholas to say it just the way he did i think it's brave for you to answer it because again the list some other listener might go you're just lucky you're not being grateful it's like yeah. well, but but i am being grateful yeah i'm just being authentic to the exactly. range of experiences that i had and, I, and by the way, that's what uh, that's how we think about the Kubler Ross stages of grief. It's not that I think those stages happen at all, but but it the stages indicate there's a range of ways of feeling. And when we get shook up from anything that's significant, there's a range of reactions, and whatever you have is what you have. And somehow saying, "Well, I have to act this way," is invalidating. Um. And so whether it be grief or in this case be medical trauma, um, it is what it is. And simply encountering and experiencing that for for its own sake, in my view, is the is the winning formula. And sometimes you need professionals to help, and sometimes you need your loved ones to help, and sometimes you need your faith to help. But it doesn't actually matter who helps. It just means that 
you become faithful, authentic in the emotional experience in such a way that it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Whatever, whatever you feel, it's okay. You don't, there's no standard book and there's no expert like me who's got, oh, this is the only way to do it. This is not true. Mm. It's not true. And I think getting back in the swing of things um, is among the most important things. And the emotions follow. We really, one of the things we really work on in clinic is getting people back into the swing of things, not avoiding things, not taking a lot of time away. Let's get you back. Even if you can only go watch one inning of the baseball game, only if you can only watch half of the football game, Uh, whatever it is, just, just get back into it. Try to do even little bits. Every small victory wins. It's a win. Take it. Take every small victory and recognize it. Be mindful that that's a step in the right direction. Give yourself a little bit of credit. Um, because I think there's a tendency once you've had such a big event, it's like, oh, here goes another big event. Instead of saying, yeah, I had a huge event. But here's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Here's a step in the right direction. Here's a step in the right direction. Um, I mean, some of these things sound like, I don't know, elementary. But when you've had a cardiac arrest, when you've had an ICD shock, when you've had your life fearfully approached, getting some normality, getting some steps in the right directions, oh yeah, is the is the the part of the women winning formula. That feels good. Yes, yeah, yeah. I actually remember the first time I was able to travel by myself again. How good that felt that I could go alone and yeah. be fine. And it was the most normal thing before all this, but it felt so good. <laughs> sure. um, and I will because say also- independence was threatened. Yeah. You were threatened. Your independence, yes. your autonomy was threatened mm. by this condition and by this treatment. So when you got your autonomy back, which you had to earn, nobody gave that to you. Nobody yeah. gave that to you. They yeah. said, you can travel. And you went, oh, heck no, I'm not going to travel. You know what could happen to me on a train? You know, what could happen to me? Oh, my gosh, no way I'm going to do that. But what would you do? You, you got, you, you approached what you were afraid of. Yeah. And the other thing is I like that you noticed you won. Mm. Yeah. You did it. Yes. And, uh, and, and so that's an example of how, in my view, I like to work with um, heart patients and particularly young heart patients. Um a, because they have so much to deal with, but B, they acquire this special knowledge. They later say, I get it, man. I get life a little bit better. I get that nothing's given to me. I get that that I I should honor the change of seasons. I, 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 I should honor having a cup of coffee with my friend. Yeah. I, 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 every one of these days matters. I, I think you have... The, Honestly, I th- I think hard patients have a little bit of secret wisdom from all of this. Yeah, I do. I, I, I so many people need this, right? Do you you do you know the term? Um, do you, you have the term Karen or Ken? You know, where people throw a big fit about something that doesn't matter. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, I know Karen. Okay. Figure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right. So the idea is that you know it's it. I hate the way that it sounds sexist because they tend to use Karen, but men do it all the time too. They uh-huh. just do it differently. But the point is people feel invalidated and they make a big deal about nothing. Mm. I think they lack the the insight that heart patients have in spades. You know, maybe, maybe what you're reacting to doesn't matter quite so much when everything you've ever had and everything you love has been threatened. You True. value what you got so much more yes. and there's nobody who could take that grind away from you. That is a, that is a special golden nugget of wisdom. It comes with a cost, but it is, uh, yeah, it is it is wisdom. Wisdom comes often with a cost, though. Yeah, and, and don't you see? I mean, you're a young guy talking about the meaning of life right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, where are you, know, you, you going to go out? Are you going to go hang out with your buddies and talk about the meaning of life later? Oh, heck no. <laughs> well, yeah. That's with some need. I do, though. That's with some need. I do. But you're right. There's plenty of people around my age who who didn't have to think about all this stuff, about death and about life in a way that I was confronted with. Which does, again, create some aspects of carefreeness to them. Uh, but it does yeah, give me some kind of wisdom. 
that could serve me actually to live a better life. So, yes. And I think part of my comments is not to make this all um, Pollyannish or you know, overly magnify it, but to simply say, look, this is a way of finding silver lining in, in a, in a absolutely disruptive event. Hmm. And I do think it's a real finding. Um, we have some evidence from just heart attack patients that uh, as many as 40 to 50% of them will later say it was the best thing that ever happened to them. Right. Uh, these are older studies, but the reason that people say that is because I think it did re it triggers a reprioritization. It triggers a sorting of what matters and what doesn't matter. Yeah. And those are the building blocks in my view that make the wisdom happen. Yeah. You hear that with cancer patients too, right? Uh, I'm not saying for all of them, right? But uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, the study I'm citing is from 1999 where they did oh, wow. compare cancer yeah. and oncology patients. I'm sorry, cardiology and oncology patients. And it was, in fact, that cardiology patients did get more meaning from life than even oncology patients. It was a, um, a comparison study. Um, and uh, it's actually a pretty interesting idea. We, we haven't revisited that, but it's definitely a study I'd like to get back to doing and looking yeah. at that. I just would hate to invalidate the the cardiac patient experience by saying, don't you feel better? Aren't you, you know, we, we're back to the same question again, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the very thing we just talked about in this thing. He's like, oh, oh, you don't have special knowledge? Well, what's wrong with you? Well, no, <laughs> you know, we are where you are where you are. And the hope is that we develop those kinds of things over time, but to be very self-compassionate. To be compassionate towards oneself and say, okay, you know what? You're doing you're doing all you can right now. You're doing the best you can now. And you keep on striving and keep on pushing toward um, making small goals and small victories and, and and get there. But I would hate to be the other side of the coin I've already talked about during this call, which is like, oh, you, don't you feel grateful? Yeah, but that that's not the whole experience. Yeah. And Nicholas, if you're listening and you know, you want to chat, I'm always here. So you can always reach out to me. Uh, always open for a chat. Hey, sorry to interrupt the interview here with Dr. Sears. Uh, this will just take a short moment. If you so far found the episode to be insightful and helpful, and you know, you feel like you gained something out of this episode already, and you want to support the platform, th that you can do that. We have some merchandise like the hoodie, hoodie that I'm wearing or we also have a mug with a quote on the back. We also have a t-shirt uh, and we have the hoodie and a mug with a different design also. So this one is meant for in a way everyone. But then we also have uh, with I'm a heart warrior on the mug or on the pullover or on the t-shirt. And th th those are meant expli explicitly for cardiac arrest survivors solely. You know, if you are a co-survivor or you're just curious to learn more about cardiac arrest and about ICDs and you want to support the platform, then this pullover with this design on or this mug are great. Um, and if you're a survivor, then there is also the other design to choose from if you want with I'm a heart warrior on. Uh, now, if you don't per se, you know, want to buy any of our merch, but you do want to support the platform, then we also offer donations. So yeah, that's possible too. Uh, now in the description of this episode, I will put a link to find, you know, out where you can buy our merch or to make a donation. Uh, or you can also go directly to Hard Warrior Project slash Get Involved uh, to to yeah to get to the same place. <laughs> all right, that's all I wanted to say. Let's continue on now with the episode here with Doctor Sears. Okay, so here is a question from Cindy. Uh, it is okay. So the question is: It will be great to get a insight on how to get family and friends to understand the depths of the changes. It, this question kind of builds a little bit maybe on Nicholas' question in a way too, right? Uh, so uh, to continue, uh, to understand the depths uh, of the changes in you or anyone after a hard event. I know I didn't understand the changes in my father until I went through this. Those changes are positive and negative, but I think there is a fundamental change uh, either introducing a new you or bringing back the original you. 
Either way, you're no longer the person they are used to being with. Uh, and I made uh, this year from that question. So how can we as survivors make people aware of the difficult road it is to survive a cardiac arrest and introduce to our loved ones the new you or you know this different version of you to them? Well, let me just advance even more complication here, which is the people you're trying to communicate the new you to Mm -hmm. often live through the process by which the new you got created. So they have their own personal experience of it. Yeah, you're right. And frankly, it was terrifying for them. I mean, it's interesting. Every now and then I'll see a cardiac arrest patient who has no recollection whatsoever about what happened. Mm -hmm. But the spouse will come in with them and say, you just have no idea. And then the spouse will just go forward and talk about gruesome details. And the, the patient is sitting there saying, I I don't remember any of that. It's not even, that's not my experience. So how do they overcome that? Right. I mean, this happens in clinic a lot. We see this pretty common in a true cardiac arrest survivor. So I think the, the, so before I answer the question, the complication is that the, the receiver of the information you want to share is already affected by the content that you're about to tell them because they lived it. Yeah, yeah. And even if they weren't there, they got the phone call. Even yes. if they weren't directly giving CPR, they were traumatized. That phone rings and they don't know where you are. Let me tell you. They they got a they have a so called flashback that's a clinical term but they have they have a an intrusive memory that hits. So, how do two people with totally different experiences of the same event communicate? And I think the only answer to that can be to be open to, and accepting of the authentic experience, so that. I want to hear what you felt. Mm. I want to hear what you saw. I want to hear what you thought. To basically allow for the multiple senses, to allow for multiple conversations mm-hmm. yeah. from each other's perspective. So I've seen it go every which way. I've seen the patient say, I don't want to hear about that. And I've heard the spouse say, well, aren't you just grateful? In both cases, you have a shutdown or an invalidation occurring. So being open to being uncomfortable, that's another way to say what we've been talking about, being open to being psychologically uncomfortable because being open to that is healing for both. I mean, it's natural to want to stay comfortable. It's natural to want to avoid unpleasant unpleasantries. But when we do that and they're so important and and so significant, then we've shut the other person down. We've stopped a a point of connection that matters. So to me, I think it's a really being open to negative emotions and just saying negative emotions will not hurt us. You will not die of anxiety. You will not. You will not die from traumatic thoughts. But it'll be unpleasant and being open to that unpleasantness reduces some of the power of them. It's a weird, this is weird, right? It's not completely natural, the things I'm saying. It's not completely natural to say, look, you'll feel stronger and healthier if you open yourself up to unpleasantries. <laughs> what? What? How does that even work? <laughs> okay. It's like saying, you'll like good food if you eat bad food sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's weird. That's yeah. a weird way to think about things. On uh-huh. the other hand, that could kind of probably work too, yeah. right? Yeah. I mean, if you eat fast food all the time and then go to a nice restaurant and the food tastes really different, you'd be like, oh, that's good food right there. Well, it's similar. You know, I think that if you try to shut down negative emotions, you're blunting the breadth of experience of being a human and this area leads you to want to do that because you've got to get through the events and you got to get back to living so there's a tendency to sort of jump the jump the processing of emotions and just get back into it 
And that does kind of work. It is good to get back in the swing of things, but you have to bring the attitude and emotions along behind. So this idea of introducing yourself to loved ones again is a process. The This idea also involves both sides of the conversation need empathy and mutual respect for their own unique experience, whatever it is. And and to be committed to it, to say that my relationship to you is so important that I want to talk about what scares me. I want you to know me because I'm lonely without you knowing exactly what I went through. And I'm sorry that that's hard for both of us. But it's worth it for you and me to have this knowledge of each other, this intimacy for each other. It's powerful to know someone and know their inner experience about something. It's the ultimate of love, man. It's the ultimate of, man, you got me. I mean, that's the best part of life, man. The best part of life when you can know someone like that and respect someone's experience like that. So I love this question. You know, I don't think there's a perfect handbook to doing it, but certainly we've hit on some of the key aspects of it. Yes, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I can only say for myself, like, because my girlfriend actually was the one who saved me. Um, uh, yeah, so she did CPR on me. So very traumatic for her also, all this. Um, but we talk so much about this, and yeah, it's healing. It does feel good. It's sometimes very uncomfortable for me to hear all those things. But the end result is at least that we feel even closer to each other. So I think if you do dare to do open up or to ask, you know, or show things about yourself, this new you to the other person, you do a lot of times start to feel closer to each other. So yeah. it, it's worth the risk, I would say. It's worth the risk to try it. Yeah, I th- I thought I like the way you say that. I think it's worth the risk. It's not zero risk. Yeah, no. It's not zero risk. We've yeah. certainly seen people who just could not walk in that other person's shoes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um it doesn't happen a lot. But it does happen. In my view, that probably would have happened anyway that that life is so interesting and full of great moments, but also adversities. And relating to other people through both is harrowing. It's not for everyone, but it's lonely to try to avoid adversity. It won't really work anyway. Yeah. Yeah. It's a bit um, it like really a sur- won't work anyway. It's like a surgery in a way that you need, you know, there's a risk maybe of an infection or something going wrong, but the chances that it will work are much higher and the benefits yeah. of that surgery are much more greater than not doing that surgery. Maybe a kind of an That's analogy. Spot on. <laughs> you need to be on your own show, man. You need to be the star of your own show here because you got that. I mean, I think that's right. I mean, yeah. I wish it were the case it's every surgery was simple, but they're not. No, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think you're I think you're right about yeah. that there's a small risk, but the the benefit far outweighs the risk. Yeah. All right. Uh another question here from Lee Richards. So could you address the perception of ICDs having consistent inappropriate shocks? Anyone who prepares for an I- for a new ICD will quickly Google to find Facebook pages and chat boards with stories of erroneous shocks. Uh, should we really be concerned? Are these just bad one-star reviews getting voiced? So, so many people are living in fear of their next shock. Uh, how do we set our minds at ease uh, when... Uh, there are so many scary stories, and um, maybe in addition to that question, I'll you know add, add this. You know, how do you cope with this constant fear of being shocked, and how to not let that fear rule your life? And maybe these are some of the like 
the stuff that you shared about an anxiety and how to cope with that, maybe this also works for that. But um, yeah, I'm just throwing the question at you. Okay. So when we think about ICD shocks, the number one thing we have to pay attention to is faith in the device and mm -hmm. feeling safe. Mm -hmm. Now, if you had 100% faith in your device and you felt 100% safe, then you'd go about your business and live life. But that's probably a little bit naive because you have symptoms from time to time. You might feel a palpitation or you feel your device move or something that's a reminder. And it, an, an, I'll call it intrusive, but just a reminder of, of, hey, I had this thing happen to me. I got a scar in the figurative and literal way, right? But the number one thing, the number one psychologic principle to start with is getting back to feeling safe. And when you encounter inappropriate shocks, shocks that were either, we, we use the word unnecessary a lot. So an unnecessary shock. So the device saw something it thought was dangerous and you got a shock. I'll call that an unnecessary shock, which is a little bit better than inappropriate. Mm, that's true. Yeah. When that happens, it undermines your faith in the device and it undermines your sense of security. That's why inappropriate shocks are so powerful because we can go back to the lay person and say, well, I mean, you just got shocked, but you weren't in danger. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I, I understand it wasn't in danger, but now the impact is, is this device keeping me safe? Do I have faith in this device? Cause essentially quote made a mistake. It didn't really make a mistake. It did exactly the way it was programmed. And that's yeah. why we call it an unnecessary shock. The device, inappropriate shocks only the really truly only inappropriate shocks are when the lead fractures right okay meaning because otherwise these are programmable and so it was programmed it detected what was in the program it's it's really that concrete as impressive as the defibrillator is it, it's only as smart as we collectively yeah. program the device true true but yeah. but so 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 let's just play this out so fear of shocks the alternative to fear of shock is is faith in the device and feeling safe. And so if if we can move from the idea of, well, this thing shocks me, yes, but I'm safer because of it. And, and so we are building blocks in how we take care of people here is, is to restore a sense of security and to create faith in the device. Now there are threats to both. For example, if you get heart failure and you start, you know, having you keep you keep getting admitted for heart failure, then you don't feel safe, but you still may have faith in the device. So you see you have both faith in your disease management and faith in your device. And those two things are kind of playing together here. And when you have inappropriate shocks, it kind of affects both. Mm. And then when those two things are affected, when you don't feel safe or you don't trust the device, then you get what I'll call behavioral avoidance. Then you start to say, well, since I'm not safe, I better stay home. Since this device can't be trusted, I don't like it. And so you get this withdrawal. And to me, that's the tragedy of all this from a psychological standpoint. And I don't mean in terms of life or death, but the, the, the tragedy is the purpose of a defibrillator is to help you feel confident and safe to go live life. So when that's undermined, we've lost one of the major benefits of the device. Sure, it'll keep you alive, but you're miserable. So restoring confidence, restoring f sense of security and faith in the device are two very, very important friends. I build everything from there. If you came to me and you got a bunch of shocks and you said, I don't want to worry about shocks anymore, I'd say, well, first thing we got to do is say, what are the chances of you being shocked? What are we doing to make sure you're not shocked? And how safe do you feel and secure about this device? So let's get at some of that. So first and foremost, what are the chances of being shocked? And what is the chance of all defibrillator patients across the world being shocked? If you have a defibrillator, what are the chances in a one annual year of being shocked? Do you, you, your audience may not know this. 
Neither do so I. it depends on the reason you got a defibrillator, but it's somewhere between yeah. four and six percent for primary prevention, and closer to four to nine to ten percent uh, for those that have had a frank cardiac arrest. Uh-huh. So we're basically talking about so so you have a, di- a different way to say this would be you have a ninety five percent chance in a given year of not being shocked. If five percent is the number we settle on, just for the sake of argument, because it, it depends, right? We can, depending on your condition and your medicines and the, the way the device is programmed, and 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 a number of comorbidities and other things, kidney function, we can go on and on. But just as a working number, five percent. So you have a ninety-five percent chance of not being shocked, and by the way, you have about a one to two percent of an inappropriate shock rate. One to two percent. Okay, so having said that, then, if you're worrying about shock all the time, statistically, you probably don't need to because the numbers don't really add up to that. But um, nonetheless, that's that's one thing. Secondly, your medical team, the purpose of all of your remote monitoring, the purpose of your medicines, the purpose of the expertise in an electrophysiology clinic is to prevent shocks. Mm-hmm. That is, everybody agrees that we don't ever want you to be shocked. And if you are shocked, we want you shocked one time and one time only to get you out of the rhythm. Now, it doesn't work out perfectly. It does not. Okay, so it ain't perfect science. But your medical team shares the exact same goals that you have. And I I like to think that our research has had something to do with that. We've really pushed hard to improve the precision of, of of the use of shock. So the goal here, and at least I'm talking about a transvenous regular defibrillator unit, the most common units that we're talking about in that range. So then what do we do? So since I said these things are so important, faith in the faith in the device and sense of security, because the next step is to get stuff done, to do things. So when those two things are threatened, people withdraw. So if you're going to get better with those two things, you got to engage. So engaging again um, is so important because you you can't just say I feel safe and I I feel safe for my device with my device and I I love my device. I'm going to sit in my house all day every day, but I feel safe. Well, that's not feeling safe, right? If there's not a behavioral signature, a marker that says. I think you feel this way because you behave this way, then we've got something. So overcoming shock fear is both having some knowledge, which I've given just now, then the next is having some actions that demonstrate Mm -hmm. that, and then the feelings come last. Mm. The feelings come last. The feelings come from the evidence that you're out doing things, out living life. Then you say, just like you, you, at no time did you say, oh, I can't, I want to travel, but... I'm just, I could travel, but I'm just going to stay here at my house. No, it wasn't until you traveled. Yeah. And then you said, that feels good. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been, I've been on a little bit of a rant lately in the research journals about this. That is, I think people have to move more and then feel better. And I think cardiologists tend to think, well, I'll just help you feel better and then you'll move more. I don't think that's true. I think you have to move more to feel better. Interesting. Yeah. And we have data to support this, right? So we have um, multiple studies looking at the accelerometer inside your defibrillator. Um, our work's been focused on on how the device measures movement inside. So you actually have a, essentially a Fitbit inside your implantable defibrillator that gives us movement information. It's there. It, it's there because of what's called rate responsive pacing, right? So the pacemaker knows that you're walking up steps because the device is rattling. And so it's detecting that and it speeds up and gives a more naturalistic feel about one's heart rate improving or going faster when you exercise. So that accelerometer has a purpose. But it also keeps track of active and inactive minutes. And we've shown that that it, that in patients who have been shocked, it takes over three months before they get back to much movement. Wow back to wow. average yeah and it takes almost two years to reduce some of the shock anxieties if no other treatments offered okay so in these large clinical trials no over treatment was offered but it means that this question's a big one because there's a tendency to withdraw 
at least for three months. And there's a tendency to continue to be sort of self-protective or vigilant, very mm. careful, walking on eggshells because you don't want to so-called trigger a shock. And uh, these are all false. You can't trigger a shock other than not taking your medicines. Mm. Emotions don't cause shocks. We have data on all of these things. Okay. You can't make yourself so upset to cause a shock. Now, right. if you don't take your medicines and not taking care of mismanaged stress over the long haul just wear you out. I mean, I'm talking the long haul like years. It'll wear you out because it's hard to take good care of yourself when you're hunkered, hunkered down waiting for something bad to happen. And those aren't people who are exercising. Those aren't people who are taking their medicines. Those aren't people who are out, you know, engaging in a, in a vibrant, complete life. So anxiety and depression are, are problematic in the long haul, but they don't, they're not arrhythmogenic as a, as a general rule. We're very careful about that. Certainly there's a tendency to say, but I got really upset and then I got shocked. Okay. I understand that. But, but you also are, people get shocked while they're sleeping. So how's that work? Right. So, so we can argue on anecdotes all day that, 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 that doesn't interest me as much as it's important to have strong physical health and it's important to have strong mental health, period. So, so the bottom line with, with, this, with shock anxiety is uh, that we've got to trust the device and feel safe. Then we got to go out and do stuff. And then we got to feel good about having done stuff. And then you know what happens when all that's right? Then we'll start looking at the future positively. And that's where the positive mental health is. When we can encounter cardiac problems and still see a positive, desirable future, then we've got cycle. Then we've restored something uh, around psychologic, mental, psychologic functioning and mental health. The future looks good. You're probably doing a lot better. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay, good stuff. Okay, uh, I have two more questions from listeners. If that's okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, all right. So this is from Rebecca. Uh, and her question is, uh, any advice on how to better communicate with cardiologists slash healthcare professionals? I had a, an idiopathic uh, cardiac arrest two years ago, and um, I have a hard time talking to or asking my doctors, who are wonderful technically, questions uh, or to explain things they often blame everything i experience on an anxiety which until this i never had an issue with and i just have a lot of rattling around in my head again any advice appreciated uh thank you uh and then she also uh I, I, this is for you dr sears also you helped me find a mental health professional about a year back thank you so much she has really helped me uh, get some life back and that's good to read, actually. Oh, good. I'm glad that helped. Yeah. So how do we communicate our needs to healthcare providers? So so a part of it, again, is to understand both sides of the aisle here. Mm -hmm. Healthcare providers are looking for preventing danger. Mm -hmm. They're not necessarily, certainly in cardiology, they're focused on finding something wrong. They want you to get the upside. They want you to go live life. They want you to rehab yourself. They want to all those things. But their primary objective is to find something dangerous and deal with it. So the mindset's a little bit different. Their mindset's focused on, is there any danger? And if you keep saying, I think there's danger, but they can't find any danger, then they call that anxiety. Yeah. Because yeah. they're in the danger game. And anxiety is also in the danger game, except... It's devoid of info. Anxiety is anxiety in the absence of info, usually. It's just that there's a threat, so therefore you're anxious. And cardiology is in the game of threat or risk management. They're trying to keep the threats low. Hmm. So I think that's just, the tendency here is, I think, is two different approaches to the same encounter. Cardiology says, okay, I'm in danger stamping out business, and the patient says, but I still feel like there's danger. And so that's where anxiety comes up. And I think, what can we do about that? I think certainly it is worth trying to communicate. You know, I need to know, are there any do's or don'ts? 
that's an example of communicating needs. My needs are to understand, is there anything I've done? And in, in this case, you have an idiopathic cardiac arrest, meaning that the, the medical team doesn't understand why this happened. Mm-hmm. That we're on the edge of some sort of knowledge. We just don't know. And these are tough because one of the components of psychologic adjustment is the identification of threat. If you just say, well, you have a big threat, but I don't know why and I don't know who, I don't know what. How do you adjust to that? How do you adjust to the an unknown threat? It's like uh, like a horror movie or something where he's like, you know, there's somebody wandering around getting people, but I don't know why they're doing that. It's truly terrorism. I mean, that's like that's like medical terrorism. Um, I, I tend to use the word medical lightning strike. I mean, you get struck, you know, it's a beautiful day out and you get struck by lightning. I mean, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And so psychological adjustment depends in part on making some sense of what happened. And in an idiopathic case, there's no sense. So the identification of a disease means that, yeah, you right away, you have a harder time getting through this than somebody goes, I saw the blockage, we fixed the blockage, it's over. We fixed the problem. That's a totally different initiation of coping with something than somebody who has an idiopathic process and we don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. So, so... I do understand the medical team's approaching it one way, the patient and family are approaching it another, and those two perspectives don't exactly meet. In terms of communicating needs more concretely, I do think writing down questions yeah. so that you know that they get asked during a clinic visit is very reasonable. It seems kind of elementary, but it's still very important. Um, I think a do's and don'ts is important, although there aren't very many don'ts. So there is often an answer saying you can do whatever you want, which is a great answer. But but I need to know, can I go on a sailboat? Yeah. yeah. And you go, <laughs> I said, there's a, you can do whatever you want. You say, well, okay, can I go swimming by myself? Well, no, but you shouldn't have done that anyway. <laughs> You're supposed to go swimming with somebody else. <laughs> so it's so th- th- these kinds of uh, permissive uh, permissions, if you will, if that's one of your needs, I think asking for those, although again, they'll be much more permissive than not. I think needs also often have to do with the future. When you don't know what you're dealing with, so you don't know how to make sense of the present, you sure don't know what to make of the future. And so I think a lot of times when there's a, when there's a discrepancy between the needs of, uh, needs aren't being communicated, I think it usually has to do with, okay, I'm all right right now, but the need or the question I have has to do with the future. Forecasts, prognosis, red flags. Those are the things that patients often don't feel like healthcare providers address. But some of those things are unknowns. And healthcare providers have learned to be very careful about crystal balls and trying to say this is going to happen. Even though I think it's a harmless question, it's just that healthcare providers don't want to be, they don't want to give any false hope, although that's almost never the problem. It's almost always the problem that patients and, and families expect the worst. And remember, the main job of a healthcare provider is to manage dangers, keep the threats as low as possible. And so you see, there's just a discrepancy between the, the, the orientation to the clinical encounter between patients and families. And then when you add the perspective of well, what's going to happen in the future, well, you've just got a, 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 a two very different uh, hmm. perspectives encountering you, a, a collision of very different, uh, expectations for the encounter i do know from the women that i had on the show who had a cardiac arrest that they often get told to more quickly than men that they deal with an anxiety even though that they are actually yes. even though that they don't feel like that that they are just very cautious and want to know these questions but that they might come across like that to cardiologists and then get told like oh you deal with an anxiety or stuff like that so i think that can be quite frustrating for them yeah I, well we do know uh 
in epidemiology literature that women are have a two to one risk for uh, reporting anxiety or depression. Oh, okay. Now we yeah. don't know what that means other than women are more likely to report. Uh-huh. Yeah. But we also know that there's a long history of essentially a sex bias mm. toward women um, that goes yes. all the way back to Freud and other people who suggested that women were hysterical, which was Freud's words back in the day. Yeah. So it is the case that there's pretty blatant potential of sex or sexism or, or bias based on sex in terms of psychological reporting. And uh, so we've got to be really sensitive to that. And you're, I like what you said. That must be incredibly infuriating for mm-hmm. someone to simply say, you're anxious, when in fact it's like, no, I have concerns that I want to address. And, um, and I want you to respect those because again, what happened, just like we talked about earlier, it's emotional invalidation and that is just not going to work out well for anyone. Emotional invalidation is a core problem, uh, in, in this space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So let me just throw the last question at you, which I am actually very curious about, and it is, uh, from, Virginia, could an ICD REA program be developed to help patients enter into the ICD world with more confidence? Uh, something similar to the cardiac REA programs many uh, hospitals offer. And uh, then I also added this to it. Uh, are you aware of such a program like this being researched or possibly appearing in the future? Is there something like that? This is my greatest dream. Yeah. Okay. The goal here at East Carolina and, and for our research to be disseminated around the world is that this is exactly what ICD patients need. And the same with patients with repairs of the aorta, patients that have been repaired with bypass. Because in the United States, only patients have had a heart attack, uh, a bypass surgery, or heart failure qualify for cardiac rehab. Oh, so, wow. for example, yeah. the the last, uh, the last uh, question had to do with idiopathic sudden cardiac arrest. This patient would not qualify in the United States for cardiac rehab. Wow. Yeah. It's kind of an arbitrary set of decisions that have been made uh, yeah. in terms of insurance coverage for that, but that is a, definitely an American problem. Yeah. Now, having said that, yes, my goal for our all of my work and the goal of work across all patients with cardiovascular in- intervention, surgery and devices, and is to restore rehab via exercise and supportive care to restore a full life and to demonstrate confidence again. That is, that's what we're building here. Um, in every meeting, I say again and again that I want our patients to be the most confident about the future, and I want our patients to be the most active in terms of measurement of their movement. So I want to restore their behavior and restore their confidence. And so I love this question. It is it is the question. It is the paramount. It is the most important thing that I want to be able to do in terms of uh, achieving something like this for ICD patients and heart patients in general. I. I dream of a day in which people will have exactly what they need to encounter these diseases, overcome them with confidence, and restore high levels or desirable levels of movement and activity again. When we get there, we will have achieved true quality of life. But is there any hope for that ever happening like in the near future? I I think there is. I think there is certainly in single payer systems. Mm -hmm. Um, We are seeing these kinds of research studies being done, uh, are they widely deployed? No, they're not widely deployed, but, but I think we're seeing more movement in that area. Things move slow with medicine. The science has to keep catch up and the health policy has to follow the the science. I mean, I want it done today. Uh, I want it done today. I want it. I want this, this, that's what we ought to be doing. That's the right thing to do. But, we're not quite there in terms of getting everybody to agree. And it turns out some of my ideas uh, and hopes and dreams don't just happen. We have to, we have to persist with them. And, and the, the ones that are really good 
you know, we'll, we're going to make happen. So, but I think that also means that patience, people listening to this podcast and, and, and being a part of the process, being part of the solution, communicating that this is a high, a high value target is something that also yeah. helps our cases. Yeah, we can also have effects on making that change happen, right? By, like you said, voicing this need. Yeah. Okay, Dr. Sears, thank you for, you know, the time and for all, you know, you know, for answering all the questions. Um, I have one last question that I that, that, that I just have. It's not from, from any listeners. And it, it's basically just, um, you know, what is something out of all the research that you've done, you know, you've written over 200 papers and publica publications. What is something that we as, you know, survivors or, or people living with an ICD don't know that you have discovered in your publications that you feel could be interesting for us to know? Is there anything coming to your mind uh, on that? Yes. A number of things come to mind. First and foremost, new newer technologies are coming. Mm. So we're going to have more options in the future about leads, about smaller devices that yeah. allow us the same capabilities. I'm excited about, I'll call them engineering advances or technologic advances. So the devices are going to be better in the future. That's number one. Number two, I think we are getting better at engaging patients in that process. So number two would be, you know, patients' voices are being heard more often, maybe not as loud as they need to be, but they are getting heard more often. I think the third thing, it has to do with technologies in which patients can be more engaged with. So I, I, there's no doubt cell phone based interaction with the device information yeah. coming to you all the time that's yes. clearly there which relates to number two the patient's voice can only be heard if they're getting some information back so i think that's exciting i think the third thing there is that patient voice uh, is being magnified because patient data is going to be presented at a higher rate in the future i think fourth is that um how we use remote monitoring, how we use the capabilities of information interchanging means that there may be fewer doctor's visits in the future. There may be less of the hassles that go along with care that technology can give us. So I think that's exciting. Um, all of these solutions have to do with after the event, I think we are getting better at before the event too. There's greater awareness than ever around cardiac arrest. There's greater awareness than ever that um, channelopathies or uh, conditions that cause arrhythmias in healthy, normal, other otherwise normal people, we're starting to learn more about those things. There's greater uh, awareness of that. I think we're doing better around some of the other diseases like atrial fibrillation, like heart failure. I think we're doing better on those things. I think a future with more cardiac rehab is is hopeful. I mean, I think the last question's relevant to that. So in all of these things, I am optimistic. I, I think there is a brighter future ahead for, for patients managing heart disease at all ages. And, you know, I haven't mentioned genetics. I haven't mentioned some other changes in medicines, but all of these technologies, whether it be a device technology or pharmacologic or genetic or, and even psychologic and behavioral, uh, we're going to continue to see ways in which we create apps for people and just ways to engage and be more proactive and, and in control and in charge of their disease. I think those are exciting technologies and there are many more coming in other that are, that are in, that will be focused on function and be focused on increased control. So I'm very enthusiastic. I'm very excited about some of the things that will come down the pike that will be both defibrillator technology, but also ancillary technologies, technology that we build in and around the defibrillator yeah, in order yeah. to continue to yeah. get greater control over um, 
uh, over the body and, and to protect our patients. Wow. I mean, as a person with an ICD, I am excited to hear actually this. So, okay. That's, that's good. Yeah, we're not giving up. We're going to get better. No. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's no question. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to get yeah. better. I mean, there's some great, smart people working on all these problems. There are people every day that get up and think about, about people like you and yeah. it's our passion. It's our, it's our, it's our reason for being. And I, I just can't think of a greater calling than trying to, help people who um, have demonstrated incredible survivorship and courage. And it's just a matter of helping them take that forward. And so it's exciting times in my view. Yeah. Well, Dr. Sears, I appreciate so much the work that you've done and that you are doing and for again, you know, for taking the time uh, for being here on the show. So uh, thank you. Oh. I love being here. Thank you. And I mean, I'd love to come back anytime. We'll be happy yeah. to share yeah. with you all the things that we're doing. And so invite me back and, uh, yeah. and uh, maybe I will link up uh, over in Europe too. So it'd be great to see you. And thanks for all that you and, and the ICD community do to help us get our work done so we can, you know, we're all collaborating on the same, with the same purpose. That's exciting. Excellent. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right, and that concludes this episode with board-certified clinical health psychologist, Dr. Samuel Sears. I hope that if you send in your question, that your question got answered by Dr. Sears. And if you didn't send any questions in, then I really hope that you did learn uh, a lot from this episode with Dr. Sears. Now, as I said in the beginning of this episode, if you want to ask your question or a question to the next cardiac health expert, then be sure to sign up to our newsletter uh, and you can find a link to do that in the description of this episode or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash newsletter. Also, to find any of the resources mentioned by Dr. Sears, check out the show notes and also in the description you can find a link or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Dr. Sears. With that... Thank you for being here and for joining me uh, and Dr. Sears. And I really, really, really hope that you gained something out of this episode uh, to help you in your life. Being a cardiac arrest survivor and living with an ICD is a whole journey <laughs> that I know all too well about. And I hope by doing these episodes with cardiac health experts, that journey might become a little bit easier, right? Just a little bit. But... I really hope so. So again, thank you for being here. And uh, maybe I get to uh, welcome you again on another episode here on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. Until then, this is your host, Yelis Fass, signing off. Oh, and one last thing before you go. If you want to support the project, then consider, you know, buying one of our merch like the hoodie that I'm wearing here. Or we have it also with a different design with I'm a Heart Warrior on. Uh, we also have a mug, this one, uh, with a quote on the back. We also have it with a different design, uh, with I'm a heart warrior on. And the ones with I'm a heart warrior on are meant to be explicitly for cardiac uh, arrest survivors solely. Uh, the one with the logo from the heart warrior project on, uh, like the pullover and the mug, anyone in a way can buy, right? And if you just want to make a donation, that's possible too, of course. Now, in the description, I will put a link that will take you to the place to find the merch or to make a, a donation. Uh, you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash get involved uh, to find it. Okay, that's all. <laughs> See you next time.